All right, we are uh, studying through the Sermon on the Mount uh, in this series of lessons that we're calling Mountaintop Lessons uh, for Modern Day Living. Although this was a sermon that was preached 2,000 years ago, uh, there, is, uh, there is still very much um, practical information in it for our daily lives. Uh, and so I want to encourage you to uh, go to Matthew chapter 5. We're kind of taking this uh, a little at a time. Uh, we've covered the first 20 verses uh, in the first couple lessons, and we're going to uh, get through another dozen or so uh, verses this morning. Uh, but as you go over there, you know, remember, let's put, put the whole thing in context. Here is Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, having gone up on, uh, on some mountain in the area of Galilee. And uh, there's scores, hundreds, perhaps thousands of people uh, who have gathered around him to hear uh, this sermon that he's preaching while he sits down at the, ch at, at the, beginning, of the uh, at the beginning of this chapter. Uh, he, I, and to me, sometimes I look at this and I, I almost feel like there's different pockets of information and each one is its own pocket of information. But I would encourage you to, to try to put all of those pockets of information together and realize that it's not just random ideas that Jesus is putting together, but it is a flow of information that he's trying to get into our lives uh, and so today is, is no different when we get to these, uh, to these contrasts that he's drawing starting in verse 21. It's not just a, a brand new section of thought that he's introducing. All of these, all of these flow together. Uh, and so the, the outline is, as we've been trying to build this outline together, uh, started out by looking at the character that a child of God is to have, those beatitudes as we often call them, uh, the character of, of life that we are to... Uh, to live out in front of others, and uh, it, it starts with our heart, and we're going to see that a lot today. Uh, it starts with our heart and what kind of heart uh, we have and recognizing that that character uh, and who we are has a, makes a difference on our influence among other people, and that's where he goes into talking about salt and light and the influence uh, that we have in the lives of other people. So don't see those as two different things. I've got to build my character, be the right kind of person so that I can have the right kind of influence on others, and as I strive to have that influence on others, uh, I've got to recognize that my responsibility uh, is not just an outward appearance of goodness and righteousness, but is to make sure that that outward appearance is not just merely outward, but is inward as well. Uh, and so Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, uh, I wouldn't say this is the theme verse for this sermon, but it's a pivotal verse. Uh, for the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20 because the, the difficulties that Jesus was facing uh, with many of these Pharisees and these scribes was the fact that these people had, had made their, their righteousness, look in chapter 5 verse 20, you see the word righteousness, they had made their righteousness an exterior thing. Uh, they had made their righteousness just something to be seen of others. They were not so much concerned about what was on the inside. Well, Jesus says God's concerned about both. He's concerned about what's on the outside, but he's also concerned uh, about our hearts and what's on the inside. And so that's why Jesus says in Matthew 5 and verse 20, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds, think about that word, not just it needs to parallel, it, not just, oh, maybe just a little bit better. No, it is to exceed, it's to abound and be uh, so much over and better than the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. But he says, if it does not exceed their righteousness, you will by no means, not by any stretch, enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, what was the, what was the deal with the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees then? What's their deal? Everything's external. They're focused on the outward uh, and, instead of focusing uh, on the internal. And so, uh, and obviously there's other issues. They were, they were neglecting some of the weightier matters of the law, as Jesus talks about uh, in, Matthew chapter, uh, in Matthew chapter 23. They had elevated their traditions over the law of God. Uh, and, uh, and so there were a lot of, a lot of things about them that, uh, that Jesus says we've got to be aware of. But here he's saying, your righteousness cannot be that which you say, well, you know, I'm just going to make sure I look good on the outside. Jesus says, that, that's not what matters. Uh, and so for the rest of this chapter, Jesus is going to build on verse 20. Uh, and and it's, not, it's not just the rest of this chapter, and then it doesn't matter for chapter 6 and 7. But by, by saying in chapter 5, verse 20, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, no way in the world you're going to, to heaven. Okay, 
then what does that involve? It involves my heart. Uh, and so when we get in chapter 5, starting verse 21 and going through the rest of this chapter, from chapter 5, verse 21, down through verse 48, Jesus is focused in on the Christian's righteous heart. Um, your righteousness has to exceed their righteousness. Okay, what's my righteousness? I've got to have a righteous heart. And what he does starting in verse 21, and I don't know, depending on what kind of a, uh, of a Bible translation you have, Perhaps you have paragraphs marked out in your Bible. Uh, perhaps you have those paragraphs with some kind of a paragraph heading. Uh, all of those were put in by man, understand that, the divisions there, the headings there. Uh, but in most newer translations, you're going to have six different blocks of thought from verse 21 down through verse 48. I don't know if you see those in your Bible, six different paragraphs, six different paragraph headings uh, in this section. And so what Jesus is doing for the rest of this chapter, is he's drawing contrasts. And, and you, you know the, you know the, uh, the terminology uh, that he's using here, uh, where he says in chapter 5 and verse 21, you have heard that this has been said, but I say to you. And that's, that's kind of the, uh, the phraseology, that's, that's kind of the pattern that he uses. Look in chapter 5, verse 27. You've heard that it was said, but I say to you in verse 28, look in verse 31, furthermore, it has been said. Verse 32, but I say to you. Verse 33, again, you've heard that it has been said. Uh, but I say to you in verse 34. Verse 38, you have heard that it has been said. Verse 39, but I tell you. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said. Verse 44, but I say to you. You see the pattern. And so what Jesus is doing, he's using kind of what was a common debate uh, tactic in that day, and that is, and, and not just in that day, for, for centuries after, but what he's doing is he's presenting his case by saying, okay, here is what has been said. Uh, and so a, a debate proposition would say, okay, here's what has been said, but here is what I am saying about that particular uh, statement that is being made. Um, and so he's, he's contrasting and, and so you'll note that he says, but I say to you, but I say to you. He's contrasting what has been said. Now, our mindset might be, well, he's contrasting himself with the old law. Because sometimes he says, you have heard that it has been said, you shall not murder. You've heard that it has been said, you shall not commit adultery. And so we might think he's contrasting himself with the old law. But it's not just the old law. It's, it's not really the old law that he's focused on. What he's focused on is, what have these Pharisees been doing with the old law? What have they been saying about the old law? Jesus is not coming along and tearing down the old law. Don't get that in your mind at all. Who gave the old law? Who gave the law of Moses? Uh, that'd be God. So he's not coming along and saying, wow, look at this horrible law over here. Well, let me fix this. No, 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 no. He's not saying there was anything wrong with that law. He's saying what's wrong is what the Pharisees and the scribes and these Jews over the centuries have done to that law. And so his contrast is, here's what they're saying, but here's what I say to you. Did Jesus have a part in giving this law? Well, yeah, of course, Jesus is God. And so Jesus is coming along. What does verse 17 say Jesus is going to do with the law? Is he destroying the law? No, he's not destroying the law. What's he doing to the law? He's fulfilling the law. And so Jesus is, um, Jesus, anybody own a big yacht? Anybody got a big yacht out there on the water? Nobody's raising your hand. All right. Do you know what happens to those big yachts after a while, after they stay in the water? Uh, you know what gets on the bottom of those boats uh, that are out there on the oceans that when they never come out? Oh, they get those nice barnacles on there. Uh, and so there are times when those, those big boats have to be lifted out of the water and those barnacles scraped off and removed, and the, and the hull of that ship restored to the way that it was before. Otherwise, there, there's all sorts of issues, and we won't get into that. But it has to be restored to the way that it was before so that it can operate, that it can continue to last, and do what it's intended to do. What Jesus is doing is saying, look at all these stinking barnacles that the Pharisees and the scribes have attached to my law. So he's lifting the law up and he's scraping all these barnacles off to say, hang on a second, let's get back to the way God originally set this out to be. Here's what I say to you. And, and he's trying to get them to see, um, 
that even in the Old Testament, and, and here's, here's a mindset we've got to get rid of, even in the Old Testament, the, the commandments that God gave, the laws that God gave, were not merely just to be externally obeyed. It's not that you come to the New Testament and God all of a sudden says, hey, put an emphasis on the heart now. I didn't really have an emphasis on the heart before, but now I want it. There was not an absence of that in the Old Testament. It, it, was, it was what the Jews had done to this. Uh, and so Jesus is trying to come back and focus on the thought, focus on the intent behind the commands, uh, behind the actions uh, that they were to take. Uh, you know, it, it, in, order, in order to be right on the outside, you've got to be right and righteous, and that's why we're calling this the righteous heart that somebody's got to have uh, on the inside. But obviously, what we're seeing played out in these verses as well is the authority by which Jesus is speaking. But I say to you, but I say to you, but I say to you. That's why when you get to the end of this sermon, the last two verses of chapter 7, why were they amazed? Because he spoke as one having authority. When the, in the Old Testament, when the prophets had a message, when the prophets had a message, they would usually often start that message by saying, Thus saith the Lord. Did that indicate that the message came from the prophet? That the prophet was the authority? You need to listen to the prophet for the prophet's sake. When the prophet said, thus saith the Lord, it's not him. It's the Lord who's the authority. All right, so then you come to the New Testament, you got these scribes, and these scribes come along, and these scribes say, well, you know, it has been said, and they would read some passage, or it is believed that this is what this means, and he, and he gives some kind of uh, commentary on it. So you have some people saying, well, here's what the Lord says. You have some people saying, well, here's our interpretation. Here's our commentary on it. And then Jesus comes along and says, not here's what the Lord says and here's what other people say. Here's what I say. I'm the one who has authority. I am God. Uh, and so it, when, when he gets done with this sermon, they are astonished uh, by what they are hearing. And so that's what we need to see as we go through these. And so I want you to see these six contrasts that he's drawing. We're going to look at three of them today, uh, down through verse 32. Next Sunday, we will look at the, uh, the other three contrasts from verse 33 uh, down to verse 48. But let's start in verse 21. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll have to move through these um, kind of rapidly in order to uh, make some progress here. Um, but he says in verse 21, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. Well, where'd that come from? Well, obviously, that's in the Ten Commandments, right? But they, the Jews added on something to that. You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Well, the Jews had added this idea, well, you know, you better be careful if you murder somebody because you might end up going to court. Uh, well, was there a different penalty for murder in the Old Testament than going to court? It was called the death penalty. Uh, it was called capital punishment. Uh, and so they, they again had kind of uh, added on to the law of God, but he says, the Old Testament says, you shall not murder. But Jesus takes a step back from the murder. Is murder sin? Yes, murder is sin. But Jesus takes a step back from that and says, but here's what I say to you in verse 22, that whoever, who does whoever include? Anybody not included in whoever? That whoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. So the Jews were going around and saying, hey, y'all better be careful. You know, don't kill somebody. Don't murder somebody. And Jesus says, yes, that's true. But you're making this an issue about, uh, you know, taking away the capital punishment idea of it. And you're just focused on the outward action of murder. He says, take a step back from it. What if somebody's angry? They, they didn't kill them. They're just angry with their brother. Is that okay? Isn't it interesting how Jesus equates, uh, equates here the concept of murder and the concept of anger. Over in, uh, over in 1 John chapter 3, you might need to, you might need to underscore this verse. Uh, in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 15, you have the same word, whoever. 1 John 3, 15. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Oh, God, you're... Did your parents ever exaggerate anything? 
Did your parents ever exaggerate? You're like, oh, she, she, she's, she's just blowing smoke on this. She's just trying to get my attention. She doesn't really mean it. You think God exaggerates? You think he's like, oh, he doesn't really mean this. Whoever, verse, first, first, first John 3 and verse 15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So John, based upon what Jesus is saying here, uh, equates this concept of if I'm angry with my brother, if I hate my brother, in the eyes of God, I am no less guilty of sin than if I had murdered my brother. Is that serious? I mean, we, we say, well, God, I've, I've never broken any of the big commandments. Really? Well, wh where did God divide them into big and little ones? Uh, I, I don't remember that verse where he divides them into big and little ones. Uh, and so being angry, uh, not, not a, now, the New Testament uses a couple different words for anger. At least the Greek New Testament uses a couple different words for anger. Uh, sometimes it uses the word for anger where it's a, a quick, just a quick, like a flash in the pan kind of anger. It quickly comes and then it quickly goes. But the anger, that, the word that's used, being used for angry here, it's talking about, a, it's talking about a, a, an anger that builds, an anger that abides, uh, an anger that kind of broods a little bit uh, and continues to boil. Uh, and, and Jesus says, if I am angry with my brother, I've sinned in the eyes of God as much as if I'd murdered him. Can I, do I need to be careful? Here's, here's what we sometimes do. Oh, well, the Bible says be angry and don't sin, so it's okay for me to be angry. Yes, but where are you going to draw the line? And do you know that you have not crossed the line from what, you, what we would consider a righteous anger or righteous indignation, that you haven't crossed the line into sinful anger. How can I make sure that I don't cross that line into sinful anger? I learn to control my anger and my hatred on all levels. That's what I've got to do. In uh, James chapter 1, James says, Let every man be swift to hear, Slow to speak, slow to, slow to anger, slow to wrath. I better, I better put my listening cap on, better put my ears on, uh, and I better listen, but I better be slow to open my mouth, which we're going to talk about here in just a minute, Jesus is going to talk about here in just a minute, and slow to anger. But in the next verse, I think, I don't believe there's a period at the end of verse 19, I think it's either a comma or a semicolon in your Bible, where he says in the next verse, for... The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. My anger does not equal being righteous in the eyes of God. I've got to be careful uh, in, in how, I, how I act and how I behave. And that's why Paul would say to, uh, I don't remember if I, do I have any of these verses? Yeah, okay, so I threw some of these verses in the PowerPoint. That's why Paul would say in Colossians chapter 3 to, to put away anger, to put away malice to put away wrath, to take them off, not, not have anything to do with them. So Jesus says, is murder sin? Yes. But take a step back. Not just murder. If I'm angry, if I'm filled with hate towards my brother, uh, it's sin. Well, what if I open my mouth? I didn't, I didn't kill my brother, uh, but I opened my mouth. Uh, and uh, so what, he, what does he say? And whoever says to his brother, Raka, when was the last time you said Raka to somebody? You say it all the time, don't you? I mean, you, you probably said it a dozen times this last week, right? Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. What in the world is Raka? Um, Raka is, is a type of, uh, of abusive language. The, the word means, basically, you've called somebody stupid. You've called somebody a stupid idiot. You've called somebody an empty-headed idiot. I mean, that's, that's just what the word means. Oh, I don't, I don't use those words. Okay, um, maybe you don't. Do you think those words? Somebody ever cut you off? What a... Mm -hmm. Did you think those words? Maybe you said them out loud, but the person was in the other car and they couldn't hear you. Um, so what's the point here? Jesus is saying, this starts in the heart. And so... 
Think about all that's encompassed here in what Jesus is saying. Is murder wrong? Obviously it is. It makes God's big ten, right? But Jesus takes a step back and says, wait a minute, what starts in the heart is hatred and anger. And that might boil forth in calling somebody an empty-headed uh, idiot. Or he talks about using the word fool. Do you notice the Greek word for fool on the screen? M-O-R-O. -O. Oh, it just has a different last letter. A moron? Here, here, here's somebody who's a fool in, in, in our estimation. Somebody who's a fool. Uh, somebody who is a uh, who we would might consider to be some kind of a of a moron who's who is kind of a worthless. The idea here is being a worthless, immoral person. Is it okay for me to go around calling people fools? Uh, I've got to be careful with my words. I've got to be careful with my speech. Now, where do the words come from? My words come from my heart. And so Jesus, again, is, is focused in on making sure that our hearts are right in the eyes of God. And if our hearts are right, then our hearts will control the words that come out of our mouth. If our hearts are right, our hearts will control the actions uh, but that, uh, that we engage in. Look, look, over, look over in chapter 12. Look in chapter, Matthew chapter 12. Look in chapter 12, uh, verse 35. Matthew 12, verse 35. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what? Good things. That's what's in his heart. But an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart, what does he bring forth? That's, that's, that's all that's in there. If, if I've got evil filled in, my, filled in my heart, can I bring forth good? It's not in there. I'm, I'm not going to find it in there. And so Jesus says it starts with what kind of heart I have and, and how I'm cultivating that heart. Go to chapter uh, 15. Look over in, in Matthew chapter 15. Look in verse 18. Matthew 15 verse 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth. Did I put any of these verses on the screen? Nope, I didn't. All right. Um, Matthew 15 verse 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. Where do they come from? They come from the heart. And they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Do I need to be concerned? Do I need to be concerned about what I think? Even if it never comes out of my mouth. You know, and so Jesus is encompassing my actions, my words, my thoughts. All of these are generated by what kind of heart I allow myself to have. So come back to Matthew chapter 5. Is, it, is any of this touching any of us today? When we're calling these lessons, uh, mountaintop lessons, Sermon on the Mount for modern day living, does any of this have to do with 21st century living? Uh, any, I mean, anybody, anybody ever feeling any anger, any hatred uh, toward, towards somebody else? Um, you know, G, 1 John chapter 4 would say, I cannot say I hate my brother and love God at the same time. you got to pick one. But you can't have both, you can't do both uh, at the same time. Okay, so, here's the deal. And, and it's as if Jesus knows when he's saying these things, oh no, Jesus, I've done this. I haven't murdered my brother yet. <clears throat> yet. I haven't murdered him, but boy, I've had these thoughts, I've said these words, I've done him wrong, I have mistreated him. All right, what do I do now? And Jesus, when you come back to Matthew chapter 5 and begin in verse 23, he says, you've got to make it right. When you are at odds with your brother, look at the word therefore in verse 23. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, you've come to the temple, and you've come there with a sacrifice to make to God so that you can be right with God. And you bring that sacrifice into the temple compound. You walk into the, the court of, the, uh, the, court of the, the priest there. And you ready, oh, I'm ready to offer the sacrifice so that my sins can be, and I can be right with God. But you remember, he says, Jesus says, you remember that your brother has something against you. Hmm. Why would your brother have something against you? Because you've done something against him. You've said something, you've done something that, that's wrong towards your brother. You get there to get 
to get yourself right with God. And he says, but you remember you're not right with your brother. Can you be right with God if you're not right with your brother? Jesus says you cannot. So he says, leave the gift there before the altar and go your way. Go away. Do you see the word first in your Bible in verse 24? First, be reconciled to your brother. And then, come and offer your gift to God. I can't get right with God if I haven't made things right with a brother. And so what Jesus does here is he says, if there is conflict between two brothers, the one who has done the wrong, the one who has wronged the other brother, it's my responsibility to take the initiative to go and to make things right. Oh, but he's so sensitive. If I've done him wrong, it's my responsibility. To, but he deserved it. If I've done him wrong. <laughs> you see, there's no excuses, right? If I've done him wrong. Jesus says it's my responsibility to go and make things right. Otherwise, I cannot be right with God. Is that hard? Well, yeah, it's hard. Is being right with God what I need more than anything else? Yeah. So if I've done the wrong, it's my responsibility to go and to make things right. But you all know chapter 18. We don't have time to go over and look at it. You know chapter 18, verse 15, down through verse 18. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus flips the responsibility And he says, if your brother has sinned against you, you go to him and you work this out between you and him alone. So who does Jesus put the responsibility on in Matthew chapter 18? The person who has been wronged. I feel I've been wronged. I go and work this out with my brother. Okay, is Jesus contradicting himself? Matthew chapter 5, he says, the responsibility for reconciliation is it lies upon the one who has done the wrong. Matthew chapter 18, he says, the the person who's responsible for reconciliation is the person who has been wronged to take the initiative to go to the person who has wronged him. So Jesus must be contradicting himself because he can't make up his mind, right? Bill? That's right. You've got to cover it from both ends. As, as Phil says, you know, the, the responsibility is there. Uh, even if I don't, I may not realize I've done something or I may not realize it was that big of a deal. Um, but, but the responsibility, Jesus puts that responsibility on both sides. He's not contradicting himself, and you know that. He's putting, the con- he's putting the responsibility on both sides. If I've done something wrong, it's not, well, you know, they, maybe, maybe, they, maybe it didn't bother them. They didn't really say anything to me. No. If I've done a wrong, I need to, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Is being right with God, is that a big deal? Do, do I want to take a chance that I get to the day of judgment and God says, you know what? You, you did this person right, and you never, you never once went to them to work things out. Is that, is, that worth, is that worth it? Or if I've been on the receiving end, is it hard to go to somebody and say, you know what? That really hurt me. Is it easy to go to somebody and say, can, can we talk? Because I'm, sure, I'm not sure what's going on, but I just, this is, there's something going on with us that, that we just don't seem to be right with each other. Do I want to be right with God? I've got to work things out with my brother. I cannot say I love God and hate my brother at the same time. Things have got to, I've got to work things out. Uh, Allison? The, the, the emphasis that's being placed here in Matthew chapter 5 and in the book of 1 John, the verses that we've looked at, is specifically, particularly on those in the church, those who are our brethren. Now, are there applications that we need to make outside of the church as well? Yes. Why? Because I'm a Christian. Did Jesus come and only do right to those who were his people? Jesus came and did right to everybody. So is my responsibility to do right unto all men? Yes. Uh, And so, you know, and and so 
is there a responsibility that I especially have to those who are of the household of faith? Yes. But do I have a responsibility to all people, even outside the household of faith? What if I behave as a Christian, even to those who are outside of the household of faith? What if I have wronged somebody outside the household of faith, but I go to them and say, you know what, I am sorry that I did that, can we work? Would they be surprised to, for you to even bother to do that? Could that perhaps have a positive influence on them and their soul? So while the specific application is especially those inside the church, I believe there's application outside the church as well. Uh, you know, is remembering that, you know, passages like we've looked at already, blessed are the peacemakers, is that just in the church? No, that's everybody. That's being peacemakers with everybody. It's Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. As much as it depends upon you, well, they won't do No, no, no. As much as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Uh, and so that, that verse is, is obviously including everybody. So good question. So I, I've got a responsibility. Uh, to work things out. And so, verse, we're, we're spending too much time here. i got to get down here. Verse 25, agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him. Back in that day, sometimes, as they were, if you were upset with your brother and you were going to take him to court, you would sometimes even see each other or even walk to the court together. Can you imagine that? You know, today, your lawyer tells you, you're not allowed to talk to, you know, don't, your lawyer will tell you, don't go talk to them. Jesus says, don't wait to get to the courtroom. Fix it before you get to the courtroom. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 6 tell us about going to court against brethren? Why, why would you do that? Jesus says here, work this out while you're on your, before you ever get to the court, because if you don't work it out before you get there, matters are going to get worse. Have you ever noticed that? You think things are bad now? Jesus says they're only going to get worse. Uh, and that's what he says, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. And so, first contrast that Jesus draws on this matter of murder is he says, this, take a step back, this involves the heart that leads one to have thoughts and say words and have anger and hatred uh, that can be just as sinful uh, as the act of murder itself. All right, contrast number two, down in verse 27, is this contrast that's being drawn uh, on the matter of adultery. Verse 27, you've heard that it has been said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. Where, where, where was that said? Well, that's, that's a part of the Ten Commandments. Um, had, uh, had the Jews done anything different, changed anything about the law concerning adultery? They certainly had. So Jesus is not saying, oh, look at this old law. Isn't that archaic? You know, we should have thought better before we ever gave. No. He's saying, here's what God originally said. You shall not commit adultery. But let me tell you something about this, verse 28. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Adultery, by definition, uh, is, uh, is sexual intercourse between two individuals where at least one of them is married to somebody else. Uh, and so God has, God has uh, condemned that from the Old Testament, condemns it all the way uh, through the New Testament as well. Uh, and so in the Old Testament, it was punishable by physical death. New Testament is punishable by death, maybe not physical death, but uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says they will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, but Jesus again takes a step backwards. Is the act of adultery? Well, God, I, I haven't I haven't committed adultery with anybody. I haven't broken any of the big sins. Okay. Jesus says, but I say to you, have you ever lusted after somebody? Well, but that's not as bad. Jesus says it is as bad. Whoever looks, the word looks is in the present tense. Uh, in the Greek language, indicating not just, you know, a woman walked in front of me at the grocery store and, wow, she wasn't wearing anything. Well, I had to see her, otherwise I would have run over her uh, with, my, with my shopping cart. Um, and so I don't want to run over her, so I have to look and see her. But if I look and see her and then I, hmm, 
Keep on looking and keep on staring and keep on wanting and desiring and imagining and allowing those thoughts not just to think, wow, she should be wearing more clothes, but allow those thoughts to be wearing, hmm, I wonder if she wasn't wearing those clothes. Whoever looks at a woman to lust for her in his heart, what has he done? He's already gone through the motions in his brain. He's already gone through the motions of being intimate with this person. Jesus says he's committed adultery with her in his heart. Um, some have come to this and said, well, there, there it is. Um, you know, I, I, I've got a right to divorce my spouse uh, because they've committed adultery uh, with somebody else. Well, they haven't committed adultery with somebody else uh, because what's the definition of adultery? The definition of adultery is sexual intercourse with somebody else. Committing adultery in your heart is not sexual intercourse. Uh, that has not taken place. But Jesus' point is you have committed a sin as grave as the adultery itself, separating yourself from God because you have lusted for this person uh, and, and this sin has been uh, committed in your heart. It's, it's not a grounds uh, for, a, for an acceptable divorce and remarriage but it is a sinful matter in the eyes of God. How, how common, how common is this sin today? How common is lusting uh, for others? Is, is, are there many industries in our, in our, I was gonna say in our country, but I should say in the world, are there any industries in our world larger than the pornography industry? There's not many. Um, there's people making millions and billions of dollars because there are folks out there lusting for others in their own heart. And Jesus says, this is a serious sin. So much so, what does he say in verse 29 and 30? And obviously he's using hyperbole to an extent. He's not telling you to literally do this. But Jesus is telling us that there should not be anything. There should not be anything that keeps us from getting ourselves right with God. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body be cast into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, notice the dominant right eye, the dominant right hand. You're allowing these things to lead you into sin. Cut it off. Cast it from you. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Obviously, Jesus is not talking about self-mutilation. Um, but what is he saying? You need to take whatever steps you need to take to keep yourself from sinning. Is there some relationship? Is there some friendship? Are there some people in my life that are leading me down the wrong path into sin? What does Jesus say? Get rid of it. How, how, how can we allow that friendship how can we allow you know that interaction with is there is there a job that somebody has and this job is causing me leading me down a path where you know I, I have to do certain things that that are not right well what do I well I have to have a job no I have to get to heaven that's what I have to do I have to get to heaven uh, the rest of this stuff is do it now do I have to work so that I can eat yes but do I have to have this job or is there another job that would keep me from sinning. Jesus says, whatever it, whatever it takes to get sin out of my life, to remove this from me, I've got to get my life right, I've got to get my heart and my thoughts right, and that's his focus here, uh, is making sure that our hearts are right. Uh, I need to get involved in uh, serving others, I need to get involved in, in memorizing scriptures that can help me uh, to, uh, to get my life right with God, but whatever it takes, Jesus says, we cannot allow sin to abide in our hearts. Very briefly, and I wish we need more than three minutes, obviously, for this. Um, but the matter of divorce is what Jesus deals with, and I'll just put all of this up here because I won't have time to click all the buttons and make sure it's all getting up there. Oops, let me come back. There we go. So Jesus says in verse 31, Furthermore, it has been said, whoever, he keeps using that word. Do you think it means what he thinks it means? You think it means whoever? 
Do you think he's talking about that this applies to everybody? Yeah, this applies. Did it, did it mean it applies to everybody when he used the word up there uh, in verse 22 about whoever's angry with his brother? This applies to everybody. Verse 31, this means what he thinks it means. Whoever puts away his wife. This is what has been said. Whoever puts away his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Here's, here's something, if, if there's a lot to, to be grabbed in this. Obviously, this was a misunderstanding of what God had said in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 24, the first four verses, are misused probably more than they are properly used. Uh, I haven't done a survey on that, but I would say that those verses are probably more uh, misused than they are properly used by a lot of folks because some people go to Matthew or sorry Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 1 through 4 and in Deuteronomy chapter 24 what God was doing was God was not underscore the word not God was not commanding them to divorce their wives not commanding them to do it he was not commanding them to give them a certificate of divorce and get rid of her if you go over to, Matt, to Deuteronomy chapter 24, look for the word if in verses 1, 2, and 3. If. And, and it's in there, it's implied more than it's actually going to be found in your translation. But the first three verses are dealing with a condition. If this is the case. If this is, God's not commanding them to divorce. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16, what does it say about God's feelings towards divorce? He hates it. Does that ever change? Does God ever carve out a, a well, I, I'm, I, God hates divorce. And so he's not commanding it in Deuteronomy chapter 24. What he's doing is he's regulating something that they were doing. So in Matthew chapter 19, maybe we need to back up into this for a couple of minutes next week. But in Matthew chapter 19, when the Pharisees come to him, is it lawful for divor to divorce your spouse for any reason? You know what Jesus' is one word answer to that? If you could summarize his answer, no. It's not lawful to do that. Well, then why did Moses then command to give her a, a certificate of divorce? And what does Jesus say in Matthew chapter 19, verses 7 and 8? He did not command that to be done. He permitted it. Is there a difference between commanding somebody to do something and permitting something to do, somebody to do something? He permitted it, Matthew chapter 19, verse 8. He permitted it to happen because of the hardness of your hearts. What's Jesus dealing with in Matthew chapter 5? Hardness of hearts. And he's not taking them back to Deuteronomy chapter 24. He's taking them back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. He's saying, guys, we're going all the way back to the beginning. We're not dealing with the matter of God allowing something because of the hardness of your hearts before. We're taking this all the way back to the beginning that God created marriage. God created marriage to be permanent. God created marriage for a husband and wife to stay together for the rest of their lives and said that if any one of them leaves the other and goes and marries another, they commit adultery. Why? Because in God's eyes, they are still married to that first person. Jesus, sometimes we get, sometimes we get lost in the details Sometimes we get lost into the, who, does this person have a right to remarry? Does this person have a right to remarry? And I'm all about details. We need to make sure we're right on the details about who has a right to be, to be married to who. But can we back away and see what Jesus is saying here? He's not getting down to the minutia of who has a right. Back away and he's saying, would you all look at marriage the way God looks at marriage? Would you love marriage the way God loves marriage? And would you hate divorce? in the way God hates divorce. And if we would, then perhaps we would have that righteous heart that Jesus is longing for us to have, not looking for the exceptions so much like the Pharisees were doing, or even making exceptions like the Pharisees were doing, but saying, I want to make sure that my heart is right with God. Probably more that needed to be said on those verses, but uh, a lot there. Uh, I, I don't like the clock. I, I look forward to heaven where there won't be any clocks. That'll be fun. Thank you all for being here this morning. We'll start our worship in a little bit.